Right, so um, my, so as Marx explained earlier, my project so far has been dealing with um, dietary differences in successive proboscidean genera from the Pleistocene of South China by, by means of dental microware. So um, let's. Sorry. Oh, do it on laptop. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's introduce the genera first. We ha so in the Pleistocene of South China, these three genera, these three genera were present. We've got um, Sinomastodon in the Lower Pleistocene with a Brachiobunodont morphology, morphology of the molar that has been traditionally associated with browsing. Then we have the um, Lophodont Stegodon in the Middle Pleistocene, and then in the Upper Pleistocene we have the the genus Elephus, which is with the hypsolophodont morphology that's traditionally been associated with a more grazing diet. Elephus is the genus that includes the extant Asiatic elephant. And so this is just how, this is just, um, how the, um, gen how the um, genera are placed in the family tree of proboscideans. I can rumble on longer about um, proboscidean phylogeny, but um, that will take another talk, so let's carry on. So in South, Chi in South China, we have an enormous abundance of Pleistocene mammal fossils. So this is the fauna excavated from one cave, one cave in South China alone. And the good thing is, in, in the nearby area, we have a huge number of these caves represented by these white dots on the photograph. So the topology of the area has been largely affected by the uplift of the Tibetan plateau in the late Cenozoic. So the, the older caves are, high, are higher up in terms of altitudes and the younger caves lower down. And this, uh, this allow us to, this allow us a uh, Ours a good distinction of biostratigraphic horizons and enable us to distinguish the three key faunal stages of land mammal in, in South China during the Pleistocene. So the, lo at the lower Pleistocene, we had what was called the Gigantopithecus sinomastodon fauna, and then we go into the middle Pleistocene with the Aluropoda stegodon fauna. In fact, these two names are quite misleading because um, Gigantop Gigantopithecus, from some of the materials that are yet to be published, we, no we now know that they lasted right into the late Pleistocene, and Aluropoda was present throughout the Pleistocene, which takes us into the very end, that is the Homo elephas fauna. Yep, so if we consolidate this information with fossil records from other parts of China, we, we now know that um, Sinomastodon and Stegodon first originated in North China during the Miocene and subsequently shifted their distribution to South China during, during the Plio Pleistocene. Now, what is interesting is how, the, is how this shift in distribution took place at roughly the same time when the when members of the more derived Elephantidae family migrated into China from Africa. So in North China at about this time, we have the earliest record of the, of the mammoth in Eurasia, and subsequently we have, we have appearance of Elephas in places like the Levantine, to the Sivalik in, in, in India, and also in South China. So uh, the question we must ask is that what triggered this change? Well. Uh, a, a stock explanation when it comes to um, evolutionary history of large mammals in the Cenozoic is climate change. But, but um, we must also consider the possibility of, co of competition. What's that going on? And, a, and South China provides an, an ideal testing ground for this hypothesis because we have, all, we have all three genera representing three different families of proboscideans present in successive stages of the Pleistocene. And so, um, once we've introduced the taxa and the environmental background, we can start talking about the methods 
Well, dental microwear has been used as a way of determining diet of fossil mammals since the 1970s. The uh, most conventional method reported in the literature is the one used by, pe by people like Salunias and Semperbon and Rivals, which is essentially, essentially counts the number of pits and scratches on the occlusal facet of the molars, because, because, we, because, we, know, because we know that um, bra that browsing, which is feeding on foliages and fruits, would cr is would create more tooth and on tooth wear, which creates pits. And um, grazing is a much more abrasive diet in terms of the teeth, which leaves which um, results in food on tooth wear, which creates these scratches. The way that Salunias and Semperbon and other people have done have done it, as shown on this plot by Rivals et al, is that is that you count the number of pits and scratches from from a large number of extant ungulates and elephants to de to de to determine a morphal space of extant browsers and extant grazers and mixed feeders in terms of a a morphal space based on a biver bivariate plot of av of amount of pits versus the amount of scratches and uh, They've done so on some North American proboscideans in the Pleistocene, as you can see here. Um, the evidence supports um, the Lophodont, the Lophodont um, Columbia mammoth as more of a mixed feeder, whereas um, the American Mastodon, which is a much more Bunodont species, as largely a browser. But um, there are others who have suggested that there is a common issue with this approach, which is that which is that um, everyone perceives pits and scratches quite differently, so it is, in essence, very difficult to repeat. And um, at low magnification, which is how Semperbon has advocated, ha how Semperbon has been able to do things, it is fairly difficult to distinguish um, wear, wear patterns that are resultant from actual process of mastication and um, taphonomic defects. And, Indeed, if you're dealing with fossils because they're so precious, uh, you have to mold and cast the, spe the specimens first into samples, so there might be molding and casting defects involved as well. So um, Mark Purnell and Larissa DeSantis and their colleagues have devised a way of using a computer, uh, of generating a 3D virtual computer model of the occlusal facet and which which uses a computer software that picks up statistical differences in the t in the texture of the toothware. And um, here is a study by um, Pam Jo et al. last last year in which they've um, they've used a PCA morphospace of toothware from different species of extant bats to um, calibrate the to calibrate the diet for two types of Mesozoic mammals, Morganucodon and Cuneotherium. And um, the, Mark, the Mark Purnell method involves an Alicona infinite mi focused microscope like this, which is a very expensive piece of gear and as you can see it has a very small operating stage, which means for those huge teeth like the proboscideans, we need to mold and cast um, samples from the, occlu the occlusal facets first, and then we can look at patterns on the samples, so not the, so not the teeth themselves. Once, um, the, once the Alicona microscope software captures the 3D image, it is, it is, it is analyzed using surf stands to pick up statistical differences in the surface texture, which is analyzed using ANOVA and PCA. So um, here's just some more figures to show how the Alicona infinite focus microscope works. So on the left side are the um, low, magnific low magnification images from the occlusal facets of Cytomacidon and Stegodon. This is how um, Salunias and Rivals and other and other people would do the type of magnification that they, they would use. But um, with the Alicona Infinite Microscope, you can really distinguish what 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 area is resultant from actual tooth wear of from chewing and other, 
and defects. So what have we found? Yeah, so that's the most exciting bit, the results. So what we can see that there is a strong habitat and ecological signal from this plot. We have um, from the associated faunas that the fossil proboscideans have been found alongside, we can see that there is a we can see that um, most of the forest dwelling taxa are on the left, um, on the to the um, to the more open habitat dwelling proboscideans on the right. What's really interesting is how the two species of Cynomastodon are actually quite far apart on this plot, despite um, very despite very bunodont uh, morphology, which is quite similar in both species. Now, another point that in that's interesting is how, is how Elephus canonensis, which, which is a, which is a lofa, hypsilophodont proboscidean, which you'd expect to occupy very different morphospace from Cynomastodon, actually overlaps with Cynomastodon yansiensis. Now the, now, the possible explanation of this is a process of, of, ecological, of ecological replacement because in the early, in the early Pleistocene, we had um, Sinomastodon jalanensis, which is, as you can see on this map here, is distributed in a quite different area to Sinomastodon yansiensis, whose sites are labeled in triangles. Whereas uh, Yansiensis here is lab is lab Jalanensis here is labeled in the square and Yansiensis here. So habitat difference might be able to explain the um, perceived dietary difference. And in this in the area that I'm primarily looking at in Guangxi, right here in in South China, we had um Sinomastodon Yansiensis coexisting with Stegodon huanenensis in the early stages of the Pleistocene, which is which is um, perha which perhaps explains why these two are quite distinct in terms of their morphospace, uh, an indicator of of niche separation. And then, as I showed earlier, we see the extinction of Cynomastodon yansiensis and the subsequent evolution of Stegodon huanenensis into Stegodon orientalis. Ste Stegodon orientalis became the dominant proboscidean in South China during the Middle Pleistocene in what I showed earlier called the Aluropoda stegodon fauna. And um, so Stegodon orientalis had the area to itself for a while and then we had the dispersal of Elephas from um, perhaps the Sivalic or, uh, or other parts of the Middle East. And despite and despite its hypsilophodont morphology, which is different to the brachiolophodont morphology of Stegodon in, ter in terms of the, of the molar, it probably just took over the niche that Sinomastodon has left. So, Steg so Stegodon remains the, in the mixed feeder part of the morphospace, whereas Elephas, took Elephas canonensis took over the obligate browser part. But um, there, but um, there is um, some. There, this project is still in the um, process of completion. I need a lot more samples in order to get a more comprehensive picture of what was going on in South China during the Pleistocene, and I am yet to have um, yet to analyze any samples from Elephas maximus, which which uh, remains to this day in, as a relict population in South China, but was. Pr was the dominant proboscidean in the late Pleistocene, sh sharing its habitat with the last of the Stegodon orientalis. So, if if Elephas, if Elephas maximus shares this part of the morphospace with Cynomastodon jalanensis, that would reinforce my hypothesis that um, there, there was some sort of niche partition going on between sympa between sympatric. Um, proboscideans from the Pleistocene. Okay, just to, um, 
just to um, say, say a few thank yous to uh, Mike Benton and Christine Janis here, obviously, for, um, adv for advising me to put together this presentation. Um, I thank the um, Chinese funding bodies to purchase the expensive chemicals which, which allows me to do the molding and casting process. And, um, th and um, thanks to Mark Purnell at the University of Leicester for advising me for advising me with the methods. So um, finally, do we have any questions? <laughs>